Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Leanne. I am the educational manager here for the museum. I'm here to welcome you to our presentation tonight uh, called The Battleship New Jersey From Birth to Birth. Uh, we are looking forward to this presentation, uh, not only from Coatesville's uh, perspective of relationship uh, with steel and the Navy, uh, but also Luke and, Steel, Luke and did provide steel for the ship as well. Uh, so we are looking forward to hearing the history of the ship. And I'm here tonight to present uh, Jason Hall, who is the curator of the ship, uh, and he will take it from here. All right. I guess I can leave. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I do ask, I do always welcome questions, but I will ask to, if you can leave in the end. Uh, if you can make notes or whatnot. I will say, um, I just don't want to lose um, my spot in talking. Uh, you probably noticed the hole in the head here. Um, I did actually was uh, diagnosed in earlier this year with a brain tumor, uh, undergoing chemo. I'm fine, it's not catchy. Uh, and it's just one of those things where sometimes I may all of a sudden, uh, my talk turns into charades. Uh, where I forget the word and you know you can help me out so it is interactive uh, who here was he uh, who in the room was here five years ago for my presentation about the monitor to the New Jersey oh, oh, a couple people a couple people it's on YouTube if you have a hard time falling asleep some night uh, you can bring it up uh, it was a whole evolution of the monitor which we think steel from Lukens was in up to us, which we know steel from Lukens was in us. And I kind of took bits and pieces of a lot of things and created, basically crafted a presentation specifically for you all tonight. Um, so we're gonna be basically going over the history of the USS New Jersey. And this year marks a very important milestone as does next year, uh, because uh, well, we'll get into that when we get into the PowerPoint, uh, as far as her launching and her commissioning. Now, she had four different commissions, and uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, so you get commissioned as a warship, decommissioned, then you're no longer a commissioned ship in the Navy. She had four. Um, I'm pretty sure she has the most commissions of any other ship. And so decommissioned, put into mothballs, put into storage, recommissioned, come out of mothballs, put back in active service. Now, each of those times she got changed, modified. Now, someone has that, you have these wonderful models, and I remember them in the other room, wonderful models of ships. Someone actually asked me one time, well, so I need to do four models to show all the changes of the battles from New Jersey. I'm like, mm, actually, no. They're like, well, how many models would I need to make to show all the modifications of the Battleship New Jersey over time? I said, probably 17 or 20. <laughs> because the fact is, even in just World War II, they changed her bridge. Well, she had three different bridges just in World War II. The bridge is where they navigate the ship. As built, they had an open air bridge. They changed that. They built this rounded sort of Art <coughs> Deco bridge, which looked kind of cool to me. Ripped that off and then built the square bridge. That's just World War II. All the different commissions, they changed her constantly as things changed, especially radar. Changed her radar several times, even just in World War II. Now, World War II, Korean War era, Vietnam in the 1980s. <clears throat> now, one of the things we talk about a lot, and we'll be talking a little bit more is because everyone, of course, wants to talk about what? Those big 16-inch guns. Well, guess what? World War II in Korea, she didn't use them too much. What she was utilizing, and we'll get into it in a minute, is her anti-aircraft guns, protecting the carriers. In fact, she fired more of the 16-inch projectiles in Vietnam than she did in World War II in Korea combined. So, and then in the 1980s, in Beirut, Lebanon, in the Persian Gulf War, this span is incredible. Because one of the things we actually were talking about today, and I always like to remind everybody about the generations that served on the ship. The sailors on board the New Jersey, over the course of her career, were listening to music <coughs> from Benny Goodman to Metallica. <laughs> 
that puts it in perspective. You know, it, it was a floating home for uh, the sailors. So let's get into it. And hopefully I don't screw it up. I'm very good at screwing things up. Technology does not like me, and the computers talk to each other. I swear to God. So, she served her country for 48 years, fighting 19 major battles. If you ever come visit us on the pier, we have 19 battle stars. Now, I say this because we are the most decorated battleship in U.S. <laughs> Navy history. We're the second most decorated ship of any kind in the history of the U.S. Navy. The only other ship that has more decorations than us is the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise CB-6 from World War II. Now, I'm not saying you have to take notes during this, but we will see who's listening. <laughs> because at the end, I'm going to hit you with, what do we got, three, Jack? Yes, sir. Uh, Jack Willard is the uh, Vice President of Marketing and Sales. I won't make him do a Vanna White thing because uh, <laughs> he's my ride and I don't want to walk. So, but at the end, we're going to do some trivia. It'll be based on what I talk about. And if you get it right, Jack, they win? Uh, two tickets to tour the battleship. So two free tickets to tour the battleship. And if you guys like steel, we are 57,000 tons of it. <laughs> and so, the 19 battle stars, most decorated battleship in U.S. history, the second most decorated ship of any kind of the history of the U.S. Navy. And that's something to remember because, you know, we always compete with the other Iowa class, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, I'm not saying I'm biased, but we are the best. <laughs> But I can back it up. Okay. So the history of the battleship in New Jersey. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the 1980s. Now again, getting back to Vietnam. We were the only battleship in commission in the world during Vietnam. That's why she ends up going over with the battle stars. It's because of that. Only one in commission in the world during Vietnam. And we'll get into that a little bit later uh, when we talk about her Vietnam service. Uh, and what she did <coughs> and why she was decommissioned. Now, interestingly enough, there were actually two American battleships named for the state of New Jersey. Now, you notice on my hat, it says BB-62. And a lot of people always say, well, what's BB stand for? It does not stand for battle boat. <laughs> we are a ship. We are not a boat. Uh, whenever I hear people call it boat, it's fingernails on a chalkboard, and I correct them immediately. The British came up with a system of a letter and a number. We liked it, but we didn't want to confuse anybody, so we added a second letter. Then it became a little bit more uh, defining. <coughs> CV is a car uh, carrier. CVN, what do you think the N stands for? Nuclear. Nuclear. Nuclear carrier. Uh, SS? Steamship. Nope. Submarine. SSN nuclear submarine. So on and so forth. BB-16 was the first battleship New Jersey. Don't forget the DD. Oh, uh, we got a tin can sailor. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, so DD is destroyer. Now, DE is destroyer escort. And I'm glad you brought up this DD destroyer. So we're going to talk about uh, compare and comparison of destroyers with us. Um, and this is normally where the destroyer guys get knives and throw them at me. <laughs> but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and then, of course, DDG, Destroyer Guided Missile. Um, this is the first Battleship New Jersey, BB-16. She's kind of weird, and we'll get into that. They were trying out new things. You'll notice the two tarts are superimposed on top of each other. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, because by having them on top of each other, you're dealing with the ammo for the top one and going through the other one, and it kind of confused people, and just it just did not work out well. And you can see it a little bit better in this image here of the superimposed. <coughs> it just didn't work. And you still have turrets on the side. Now, she was part of the Great White Fleet. Now, on board the USS Kansas was someone from the New Jersey, <coughs> uh, unknown at that time, 
Does anyone want to take a guess what officer from New Jersey was on the USS Kansas as part of the Great White Fleet? Wow. He's from Halsey, I heard it. <laughs> William Bull Halsey, himself from Elizabeth, New Jersey. We'll get into a little bit about him a little bit later. Now, if you ever come to us, across the way is the USS Olympia. Uh, she is not a battleship, she's a cruiser. She was not part of the Great White Fleet. She's painted the same way, but she was not part of the actual Great White Fleet. There are no surviving ships from the Great White Fleet. However, I recommend, and I do know we have a combo ticket with Independent Seaport Museum, I do recommend you go see the Olympia before seeing us because I call her the missing link. When you go on her, you feel like you're kind of in between of the USS Constitution, the sailing ships, and the steel ships. And the USS Olympia is famous for the battle in the middle of the bay in 1898. Now, they won that battle, but you have a big difference in fire control between her and us. In the Battle of Manila Bay, the percentage of US projectiles that were hitting the Spanish fleet, 2%. <laughs> they were just throwing enough out there that they sank the fleet. And they're not doing the arc. They're doing, they're, it's like the old, I mean, you can see it. The guns on the side, these don't elevate too much. They're not doing the big arc. You know, when we fire, we're getting up there where you have to let aircraft know. <laughs> we actually scared a jet in Vietnam. So, the fire control. Now, built in 1893, Battle of Manila Bay is 1898. We're designed in 1938. So you're not talking a big difference. And so we go from this ship and the fleet that was there, 2% of the projectiles hitting the targets, to the Iowa class battleships, we can hit a moving target. We can hit a moving ship <coughs> at 23 miles away oh. with an analog mechanical computer. Mm -hmm. And we actually have our Mark 8 range keeper, our analog mechanical computer on us still works. Mm -hmm. And if you come on board us on a weekend, you actually get to play with it and pull the triggers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, video fires. We don't want like the Ben Franklin Bridge <laughs> blowing up. Man. Um, we do fire our five inch. I will tell you again this a little later. We do fire our five inch guns for New Year's Eve and Fourth of July. We do raffle off the chance for someone to pull the trigger. Uh, New Year's Eve is a wonderful time to come out and see the fireworks. It is a little chilly, but we have a bar, so drink heavily. You won't feel the cold. <laughs> and you keep me employed. <laughs> Now we're going to get into us. So December 7th, 1941, what's happening there? Pearl Harbor. Now our keel had already been laid. Our keel was laid in 1940. But we're not really in a rush because we're not in the war yet. Well, we're in the war now. Now with this, where do all the men go? To the war. Who's left to build ships? The women. Not only, not only the Rosie the Riveters. Now, the, Phil, the uh, USS New Jersey is a local girl. She, she was built in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. And a lot of the women obviously were from Philadelphia, but a lot of them were also from New Jersey in Camden County. And the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard was one of the first federal installations to desegregate. So you actually have Caucasian women and female women building together. And that's what they're building. Now, these are people. That's the bow. Anyone impressed yet? <laughs> so, and Luke and Steele is in this. Where? I have no idea. But, so, that's what's shaping up in Philadelphia. And uh, so I, one thing I will tell everybody, especially since you are from the area, um, as you saw those patches, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, 1980s, Persian Gulf, I said, look, she was born in Philadelphia and New Jersey, so Philadelphia women, New Jersey women, you don't mess with the chef. <laughs> 
<laughs> now this is the ways. Now the ways still exist. They're they're kind of crumbled. Uh, they're they're not in the best of shape. Now one of the interesting things is this is launching day, and the battleship New Jersey was launched. And now you'll know why I said this year is important. She was launched December seventh, nineteen forty two. A year to the day of Pearl Harbor. December 7th, in just a month, will be 75th anniversary of the launch of the battleship. Now, there are headlines <coughs> of newspapers in our collection of men saying, women built the ship, it's going to sink <laughs> as soon as it slides down the ways. <laughs> well, she's still around 75 years, and she looks as mean as she did when they launched her. Now, we are a part of the Iowa class. Now, there were supposed to be six ships in the Iowa class. They only built four. They built BB-61, which is the Iowa. You name the class after the first one built, USS Iowa. Oh. BB-62 is the New Jersey. BB-63 is the Missouri. BB-64 is Wisconsin. However, last one actually completed was the Missouri, BB-63. Now, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Missouri are 887 feet, three inches long. We are the longest battleship ever built in the world. And I know some of you are going, whoa, wait, wait, Yamato Musashi. They are the heaviest. They are the <clears throat> biggest. They're the biggest because they're heavier. They're wider and heavier, but we are longer. We're longer than our sisters. The women of Camden and the women of Philadelphia added four inches. <laughs> We're 887 feet, seven inches long. There's no kids in the room, right? Because right. apparently to those women, size does matter. <laughs> We're just shy of three football fields long. We're approximately five feet longer than the Titanic. Our beam or width is 108 feet, three inches wide. Do the math. We were designed to go through the Panama Canal. <coughs> 108 feet, three inches wide. The Panama Canal is 110 feet wide. Mm -hmm. There is less than a foot on either side when we go through the Panama Canal. Is anyone familiar with the buildings in Philadelphia? No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Liberty One, Liberty Two? Yeah. The twins? Okay, Liberty Two, the one without the antenna. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows how big that is, right? Okay, if you put us on end like this, we are 34 feet taller than Liberty oh 2. Oh. Just to put it in perspective how big we are. So, you know, not, not that we're like, you know, you know, obsessed with size, but <laughs> we're longer. <laughs> now, what happens though in the, in the 50s, the Wisconsin decides to hit a destroyer. Sorry. <laughs> we hit a destroyer too. They get in the way. <laughs> um, we hit one in World War II as well. USS Eaton and the Wisconsin collide. The bow of the Wisconsin is damaged. Now, remember, six ships were supposed to be built. They only built four. The other two are Illinois, she, uh, Illinois and Kentucky. Kentucky's built up the main deck. They cut off the bow of Kentucky. They used part of the bow because we have photographic proof that they did not extend the bull nose. The bull nose is this part right here. They cut this out of the Wisconsin and put it in. So they did not change your overall length. They may have changed the length of the water line, but the length, uh, the overall length did not change. Because the Wisconsin claims that they are now longer than us. So, Jack, would you please tell the rest of that story? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. You picked a good night to have me talk. Um, what happened was they promoted that the Wisconsin was longer. So, of course, being a marketing PR guy, I called him and I said, we challenge you. Let's find an independent um, engineering company or, or, or whatever company Naval measures Arctic distance Arctic. and let's measure and see who's longer. They immediately called me back and said, you guys are longer. So. <laughs> <laughs> they immediately backed off. And us being from New Jersey, we're like, that's right. 
Um, I am from New England, and I am trying to enunciate because the pack and the cat, Javi Dad, really wants to come out. <laughs> but working in South Jersey and working next to a port, I learned very quickly, you do not mess with people whose last names end in a vowel. <laughs> <laughs> because I always say, one of these days, um, my red shirt is going to show up with a fish in it. <laughs> so, but... Yes, yeah, so that's a little bit of the differences. And there is some rivalry amongst the Iowas. And we're all colleagues, because these are all museums now. It's, I think it's one of the only classes, if not the only class of ship, that all four of them are museums. Mm -hmm. We're in Canada, Missouri is in Ho uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, the Iowas in San Pedro, the Wisconsin is Norfolk. And we, we pick on each other, but we do stay very close to each other when we have different conventions. Um, you know, especially when it comes to Missouri. We'll get into her a little bit later. What could I ask you to say? That old new Missouri was that, Why is that profile look so <coughs> strange compared to the other ones or sure. on It's the yeah, it's the camouflage painting. Uh, it's called Dazzle. No, we no, never Missouri. had it. It's squales and <laughs> curves and Right. That that's paint. Yeah, that's oh, paint. Oh, oh, it's camouflage paint. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, Excuse it's called me. Dazzle. Okay. And they did that on a lot of the ships. We never had it. Now, what they did do on us is they ended up painting us a very, very dark gray to the point that we looked black. They even painted the wood deck. And that's what we got. And we built flames, so that's where we got our first nickname of Black Dragon. Mm -hmm. We had other nicknames, but I don't want to get into that yet because I'll be giving things away. So here she is. I know you guys mean steal people. Check that out. So that's actually putting the tart, part of the tart. So, you know, the gun house here, <coughs> the rest of the tart here, the shell decks and so on, lowering in. I mean, massive cranes. And so somewhere in all of this is steel from Lucan's. And this is the ship being built. And they actually, because of the size of the ship, and you've got the holes for the turrets, they're actually building housing over it. Mm. Um, but that, you know, it's amazing to me how quickly they built this, because you gotta remember, how long does it take to even build a destroyer these days, or build a submarine? <coughs> it, they built the battleship New Jersey in just over two and a half years, mm. which is insane. Um, once you got the war going on, you're doing 24-hour shifts, and they built this thing. So when you, if you ever come on us, the turrets, it looks like battle damage. It's not. It's imperfections. Because they were just like, you know, get it out, get it out. Now, I don't know if this is actually accurate, but we have enough, actually, letters and oral histories that some of the steel was arriving actually at the uh, shipyard warm. So, and there they are, mm -hmm. and Rosie Riveters, and not only uh, Caucasian females, but African American females. Um, we actually talk about one, this photograph is in our, we have a whole exhibit called New Jerseyans on the New Jersey, and one of the ones we talk about is Lillian Carson, because World War II changed society in many, many ways. So Lillian Carson, uh, who I don't believe is in this picture, uh, Lillian Carson uh, showed up at the Navy Yard to be a secretary. They were like, well, we don't need secretaries. So they sent her to a welding school. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so think about this. Prior to World War II, who would imagine, you know, females becoming welders? Mm -hmm. And so they sent her to a welding school. Uh, she worked on the battleship New Jersey. After the war, she opens her own welding shop. <laughs> she had three male welders working for her. And so it's like, it really is amazing. You know, that's why I tell everybody, the ship is not just a warship. We have so much more to tell about the changes in the society. Yeah. You can even see it with the changes in the ship. Because in World War II, when the ship was built, our heads, now remember, and I love picking on I'm sorry, ladies. I love picking on the moms because we do overnight encampments where you can stay overnight in the ship. And the moms will come on board with their kids and they're like, where's the bathroom? I'm like, we don't have any. <laughs> no. 
And they're like, what? And, they, and I'm like, well, we have heads. <laughs> I had one mom hit me. Like, <laughs> and it's just like, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, my mom would have done that too. Um, but the heads on us from World War II would have been two troughs of moving salt water. Moving salt water, one for urination, the other one would actually have a slab of wood, holes cut out, and you'd sit, <laughs> sit cheek to cheek. Uh -huh. Then they got partitions. No doors. Now, and apparently this is this happened on other ships because apparently everyone's got an oral history of this. So apparently this did happen. But we saw water. Now you have partitions. So you can do things without the guy at the end seeing you. So you got a guy down at the end. He's reading his newspaper. He's happy as a clam. He did his business, but he's got a lot of methane gas under him. So what they would do is they would take toilet paper, ball it up, Set it on fire, put it in the moving water, <laughs> it goes up. He gets right on <laughs> so, so, boys will be boys. Um, but yes. But also, you had in the mess decks, in the enlisted mess decks, it was long tables, long benches. As you're going to see in one of the picture, pictures today, it's more like McDonald's. You know, it's it's got the four chairs, and that started with Vietnam. Uh, then they changed them again in the 80s, four chairs and tables. So, we, you know, the Navy, you know, military, especially the Navy, reflects changes in society. Uh, and they always have. Uh, a good friend of mine who was my roommate served on board the Airham Lincoln. Now, I know we've got some Navy guys here. Uh, and I don't know when you guys served, but it, uh, my friends who served in the 60s or 70s cringe when I talk about my friend Jason, what he had on board the USS Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's a Nimitz class carrier. For the enlisted men to order omelets, they make an omelet to order, fresh milk all the time, Nathan's hot dogs, and, di and um, different coffees, like espressos and stuff. And my friends were like, that is not a Navy ship, that's Carnival Cruise Lines. <laughs> so, but, um, but yes, and it, it, but one thing that you have to remember though, and you know, it's trying to always increase uh, the quality of life for the sailors because it's the morale. Morale is very important. Mm -hmm. Also the food. Napoleon said it, you know, army marches on its stomach. And of course, I bet the Navy guys will say that Navy had the best food, which they did. <laughs> Our refrigerators were huge. We actually would take on whole slabs of beef. Uh, we had a butcher shop. World War II, our crew was 2,800. We'd be making 12,000 meals a day. We, because we got breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mid rats, midnight rations. Now what the kids love when we get to the bakery, and we tell them here in the bakery, they would bake 10,000 chocolate chip cookies in a day. <laughs> Now, here we go. So that's, this is what we're about to celebrate December 7th. This is the christening. This is uh, Carolyn Edison. Now, her husband, who, uh, Charles Edison, was the son of Thomas Edison. Oh, really? Charles Edison was assistant, uh, I can't remember, assistant secretary, secretary. He worked in the Navy when they named it. When they launched it, he was governor of New Jersey. So his wife, now, that silver, uh, that's a bottle holder. It still exists. The Edison Foundation owns it. And we had a long talk about this. Uh, inside here, and apparently they could call it this back then. Apparently today you can only call champagne champagne if it comes from the Champagne region of France. But that was actually New Jersey champagne. <laughs> And I'm like, well, that's probably why they're breaking it on a ship. You don't want to drink this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> kidding, Jack, don't kill me. Um, now, here's the thing that you don't see. She's wearing a mink coat. Now, she's smiling. That explodes all over her. No. Now, but the thing is, she starts laughing. And when you see everyone cheering, now, this is the one-year anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And you may think... Why are people cheering? Why are people so excited? Because one year, one year from the devastation of Pearl Harbor, we got that going down the ways. You took our ships out, guess what? Here we go. And we got this coming. 
and it's a little big. Now, so what you see is chain hanging from the bow and the next picture, which I didn't bring, this guy starts doing a jig. He's dancing. They're all just so excited. They hung chain to slow her down. Probably should have hung more chain. <laughs> she slides down the waves. She hits the Delaware River, flies across the Delaware River, and runs aground. <laughs> <laughs> Normally a bad omen. Um, now remember, it's, it's the stern of the ship that goes first. That's the rear of the ship. Yeah. That's what ran around. They decided to spin it. She just wanted to go over and kiss her namesake state. Yeah. Oh. But remember, it was the stern of the yeah. ship that yeah. did the kissing. Don't you normally kiss with this and not with that? Apparently <laughs> <laughs> it's a jersey thing. I don't know. So there's the guns. Now that she is a floating gun platform. That's the 16 inch guns. Now, we have nine of these. Each of these weigh approximately 120 tons. We have nine of them. As far as the turret, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg, the turrets go down five stories. They're all one piece, and they can turn four degrees per second. And this is what they're firing. Now, we fire two types of projectiles. The little one is for short bombardment. It weighs 1,900 pounds. The armor-piercing round to fire at other ships weighs 2,700 pounds, more than the weight of a Honda Civic. So you can't say Volkswagen Beetles anymore <laughs> because Volkswagen Beetles don't weigh this much anymore because they're plastic now. <laughs> you know, they're not made out of metal. Um, so we're firing the weight of a car, and we're firing 23 miles away. Mm. And we could fire two of these a minute. Okay. Now remember, we have nine rifles. We fire two a minute. At maximum range, it could take 60 seconds or more to get there. So we can have 18 of these coming at you before you know we've even fired at you. Mm. We don't get a lot of return fire. So there it is. I mean, this is an engineering marvel. The whole ship is an engineering marvel, but this is turret number one. Turret one, two, and three all have uh, two shell decks. Turret two, which is above one, has a third shell deck that's part of the ship, but not part of the turret. It's a little higher. So the first thing that has to be loaded is the projectile. They're on these shell decks. Now here's where, again, it gets mind-numbing, the engineering. This whole thing is one piece. It turns as one piece. This turns and this inner ring can turn clockwise or counterclockwise as it's turning with the other ring that it's on top of to bring projectiles. Now, where's my destroyer guy? Okay. What type of destroyer are we on, sir? Uh, Sumner class. Sumner, okay. Light, uh, short haul. Prior to Sumner class was another class called the Fletcher class. Yes. Anyone here ever heard of the Fletchers? Mm -hmm. All right, depending on the configuration, a Fletcher class destroyer uh, displaces or weighs approximately 2,100 tons. 2,100 tons. We were 22. You were 22. Okay, that actually, that is even better, 22. This whole turret, remember we had three of them. This whole turret was the same weight as his ship. 2,200 tons. The turret alone. That does not include the barbette, what it's sitting in. This is where we get really fun with the armor. This is sitting in a barbette that surrounds it. That is not part of that weight. That barbette is 17 inches thick of armored steel. And that is not the thickest steel on the ship. We'll get to that a little later. But since you guys are all about steel, <laughs> the top of the gun house is seven inches of solid steel. That is the thinnest armor on the gun house. The sides of the gun house are nine and a half inches thick. The rear of the gun house is 12 inches, one foot of solid steel. The front of the gun house is 17 inches of solid steel. Then you've got the three rifles and each rifle weighs 120 tons each. 
So one of our turrets weighs the same weight as his ship. So basically think about this. If we took his ship, put it this way, and turned it four degrees per second, that's what we're doing. And we have three of them. Right? So pretty amazing. So once we get the projectile up, it goes up a hoist, and there's a tray. The tray goes down. We have to load with the rifles at five degrees. We can't load at any angle. Have to be five degrees. <coughs> the hydraulic rammer rams in the projectile. Then we need the powder bags, the things that go boom. They're down here on two decks, but we only load down here. They get passed through pass-through skulls. Now, if you go on our turret two tour, <coughs> you actually get to hoist the projectile. You get to pass the powder bags to the scuttles. So you actually have the powder magazine here, a bulkhead, a scuttle, the safety zone, a scuttle, bulkhead, and then you have the powder flap. This system worked. When the Iowa had their explosion, <coughs> explosion came down and did not get into the magazines. Because fully loaded for war, fully loaded for war, we carry a little over one million pounds of gunpowder. You don't want that going off. <laughs> wait till I get into our fuel economy. <laughs> so <laughs> now, so we have three of these. Now we fire them normally turned to the side, and all three of them do not fire exactly at the same millisecond. The computer, that range keeper, is going to do it so they fire staggered. You can actually see them going through the sky because the shockwaves of one will knock off the other. Now. If we fire all three turrets to the side, how far do we move sideways? Seven feet. Three no. feet? Three feet. Three feet. Three feet. No. Nothing. Who said nothing? nothing? We don't move at all. We don't move sideways at all. It is an optical illusion and it is a myth. And unfortunately, some very reputable authors have put it in their books, despite my letters to them, and we don't move. <coughs> and the way I know we don't move is for a few reasons. One. When these rifles fire, they recoil. Recoil means when it fires, it comes back. <coughs> so the action of it firing, the rifles come back into that space, 42 to 46 inches. In addition to that, the ship weighs 57,000 tons. Also at the bottom of the hull of the ship, there's these two things coming out that are almost, almost the entire length of the hull at the bottom called skegs. They dig into the water. Because if we're doing this, we're not really that state of a gun platform, are we? In addition to that, the fire controlmen who are dialing in to that computer have always told me, Jason, if we moved sideways, we'd have to recalibrate. They never recalibrate. We do not move sideways. It is a complete myth. What happens is, and I know everyone's going to get online, but look at this picture. What it is is it's the explosion pushing the water away from the ship and it aesthetically makes it look like we're moving sideways. So, that's the lesson for the evening. <laughs> so again, hopefully everyone's taking notes so you get the free tour. Mm -hmm. Just saying. This is the thickest arm on the ship. That is the conning tower. That is on the navigation bridge. That's the 04 level. Now, our bridge seems very, very uh, small and cramped. The reason is because most, most bridges of ships don't have a bunker in the middle of it. What you're looking at is 17 and a half inches of steel. This door weighs 3,000 pounds. Hydraulics close, pins go into these holes, and it seals you in like a bank vault. So this is the thickest armor. We are designed, that is designed, to actually take damage of our own size projectiles. Now the interesting thing is the Yamato Musashi of the Japanese, they had 18 inch guns. So their projectiles are a little bit bigger than us. But our muzzle velocity was actually greater than theirs. So the actual punch was about the same with the 16 inch 50 caliber. Now, our big guns are called 16 inch 50 caliber. The caliber has nothing to do with the inside. So if you have any handgun owners, that's not what it means. Caliber has to do with the length of the rifle. The class of battleship before us, the South Dakota class, now the South Dakota was actually built almost right next to where we are birthed now. She was, birthed in, uh, she was built in Camden. 
Uh, she was known as Battleship X, uh, but she was so state of the art at the time. We're basically South Dakota class on steroids. Uh, so, uh, as far as the power of our guns, the 16 inch 50 caliber, <coughs> South Dakota class, now there's two left of that class that you can visit the Alabama and the Massachusetts. They're 16 inch 45 caliber, same projectile, same powder bags, but their rifles are shorter. So because our rifles are a little bit longer, we are more accurate than they are. And we can also go longer distance than them. So what you do is you take the caliber, you times it by the diameter of the projectile, and that gives you the length. So if anyone's doing the math, we're our rifles are approximately 66 feet long. And remember, 120 tons, they go up and down 12 degrees per second, and you have a 2200 ton turret turning four degrees per second. Designed in 1938. I'm still in the maze of what they did back then. I don't think we could build this ship today in this country, honestly. There she is. <coughs> now, I picked this picture for a couple of reasons. One, because even when she was launched, for the mission battleships had was obsolete. We weren't going to have battle lines like the Battle of Jutland. We're protecting these, the aircraft carriers. The aircraft carriers were now the capital ships of the navies. And we were utilizing our anti-aircraft artillery, the quad 40s, the five inch gun batteries, the 20 millimeter Orlikans to protect the carriers. We did not get to use the 16 inch guns too much. Also, I picked this for another reason. This is a typhoon. We went through a massive typhoon in World War II called Typhoon Cobra, also known as Halsey's Typhoon. Wonderful book by that name. Three destroyers were completely lost with all hands in that typhoon. Now, what saved us in that is a wonderful innovation called an expansion joint from the main deck, uh, basically 01 level up. So main deck, downer decks, and the superstructure levels. In the middle, we have an expansion joint. So the two pieces of the ship actually don't come together. There's a rubber membrane in between. That allows the two parts of the ship to, to bend and expel energy and not develop cracks. This one show, gives you an idea of the waves. <coughs> but we also have photographs and film of the Foxel turret one and turret two going completely underwater. Mm -hmm. And the screws coming out. Wow. And we survived it. Now this is the Quad 40. Originally as built we had 18 of these. Uh, we uh, removed a few of the 20 millimeter Orlikans and put two more on board the ship for a total of 20. Now I didn't have time to add uh, new pictures because Monday was a very special day for us because these were all removed getting ready for Vietnam. You can't shoot down jet aircraft for, uh, with them. When they removed them, they kept one and they put that one in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard by the Commandant's house. Now it had been sitting there since 1967, rotting, literally disintegrating in front of our eyes. Well, after 10 years of trying, we finally actually got ownership of it. And uh, a gentleman in North Jersey who has a trucking museum, uh, Gary Mahan, and if you ever get up to his museum, I highly recommend it, who, for no cost to the battleship, restored one of our quad 40s. And it arrived Monday. Actually, he drove it down. They had to put it on a barge crane as we put it on the port side. And where it is, we have a one in five chance of where we put it is where it actually was. And the, interest, the one thing that I tell everybody is why I was so excited because everyone's like, Jason's having puppies over here. <laughs> is because it's what I call one of those items that is an eyewitness to history. That Quad 40 was there and fired at <coughs> Iwo Jima, Mariana's Turkey Shoot, Leyte Gulf, Iwo Jima, and so on. And so we have it. Um, I believe we do have pictures of it on our website, Jack. Yes. We have a website also, if, if you friend us on Facebook. Facebook, I re highly recommend you find us on Facebook. We have a lot of events. Uh, I know nobody here likes beer, 
<laughs> because we have two beer fests, one in June, one in September. Get to the beer before I do. Although I'm not allowed to drink as much as I used to. That's the 20 millimeter Orlikens. Now we had approximately 57 of them. I say approximately because they had single barrel and then twin barrel. We're not quite sure how many we had because um, one thing that we do have documentation of is New Jersey would go into port during World War II and the next thing you know, the crew is stealing, I mean, come showing, grabbing uh, quad forward, excuse me, 20 millimeters from other ships. They just sort of ended up on us. So I don't know how many we had, but we're actually looking to get another, uh, we are looking to get one uh, with a mount. And if we do, we're gonna put it right next to the quad 40. In the line is, will be the 20 millimeter, the quad, and then the five inch twin gun mount. The entire any aircraft battery. Now, it was actually the five inch guns that actually shot down most of the kamikazes. That right there. Five inch 38 gun mount was probably one of the best gun systems the Navy ever came up with, as far as a gun. Uh, it was versatile beyond belief. You could fire at land targets, air targets, surface ships, uh, had an a ra a accurate range of nine miles. And believe it or not, they're hand loaded, hand loading, 55 pound projectiles, 35 pound powder canisters, and they had a rate of fire of 21 to 22 rounds a minute. Now, why, why they credit the five inch guns on all, all, all the ships, not just us, but the five inch gun in general, as taking out the kamikazes was that the projectile actually has what's called a proximity fuse. So you didn't have to hit the plane. You just had to be near it. 75 feet. Exactly, 75 feet. And if you look at a lot of the video of like uh, Victory at Sea, we're in that a lot. And we'll, you'll, I'll explain why in a minute, because we were someone's flagship. If you look at a lot of these battles, you see all that black explosion in the sky. We're just throwing enough steel out there to knock these planes down. But th the five inch 38 twin gun mount was amazing. Absolutely amazing. We actually use that a lot in beer. Lebanon, Vietnam, for close targets, uh, a little bit closer than the 16 inch guns. Um, originally, we had 10 of these on board the ship. Today, we only have six. In the 1980s, we removed four of them to make way for our missile systems. We actually have missiles today. If you come and visit us on the self-guided tour, or if you do a group tour, we take you to the Combat Engagement Center. Combat Engagement Center during World War II was the Admiral's cabin. Remember I kept saying we changed a lot. Now the Admiral, the problem was when they put the missile systems on, we couldn't get the consoles down to CIC, Combat Information Center. So we ripped out the Admiral's cabin where Admiral William Bull Halsey was and we created a CEC. You can actually sit at a console where you could have launched a nuclear missile, nuclear warhead. You'll see the keyholes, and I'll get into that a little bit later in the 1980s. But the one thing I will say, since I'm thinking of it, I don't want to forget about it, is do we have any football fans? <laughs> All right. Do we have any Eagles fans? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, don't bring out your checkbooks, because I can't do this. But the one thing we talk about with the Tomahawks, and I'll be showing it later, but since I am thinking about it right now, and I do lose my memory a lot, um, is the fact that the, to the Tomahawk missiles had a range of 1,500 miles. So we could sit in Camden where we are, hit the island of Cuba. For local sports fans, we could take out Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take out your checkbooks, sorry. <laughs> So this is the five inch gun mount. Now the one thing to remember is all of this isn't always right underneath. When you go through the ship, these hoists for the powder bags and projectiles are like veins going through the ship. She's very much a living being. So the powder canisters and projectiles are stored down here. You have the upper handling room and then you have the gun mount. Now the, that gun mount, as you saw, is not that big. You'd have 12 sailors in there. If you ever come and visit the 16-inch gun house, they would have 30 sailors. 
in the 16 inch gun house, 77 in the whole tart. 12 here, 12 in here, 21 in here. And remember, we had 10 of these on board the ship. So again, absolutely amazing. And the projectiles, we put in the hoist upside down. As it's going up, the cup would turn and arm the, uh, arm the projectile. We had several different types we could fire. Proximity fuse, uh, we could uh, ship. We had um, what was called uh, the star shell to illuminate Willie Pete white phosphorus, which is nasty. Um, so we could fire all different types of projectiles with this. So if you think about it, and if you ever come to us, we're firing one of our saluting guns. We fire about one pound of gunpowder. Imagine 10 five inch gun mounts. So you got 20 of those. We've got 20 quad 40s, you got 80 of those. 57 20 mil Orlikans, and you got the 916s. Can you imagine all of them going off at once? <laughs> I mean, it was just, that's why it doesn't surprise me she was called Black Dragon. Now, as I said, our biggest job was protecting the carriers. Sometimes something got through, because right there in the middle of that red circle, is a kamikaze. Now this is the USS Intrepid. This is us. Now the interesting thing about this, where this picture was taken from on us is no longer outside. They built structures uh, for the HVAC systems for the Tomahawks. And that is actually where this picture was taken. Now they're watching this happen. And unfortunately, if you know what happened, it hit. And if uh, you ever go up to the USS Intrepid in New York, they have a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, exp experience, the kamikaze experience. And it goes into what happened on them. We were strafed. We never got hit by any kamikazes. I do want to tell one story. We actually have this artifact. So it's not a story. I have the artifact. This sailor, who I think was 18 or 19 at the time, it was this attack. And I actually think of, I think it was this plane. Kamikaze goes over us, strafes us, and everyone knows what a signal lamp is. <laughs> blows it apart. So there's pieces of glass everywhere. So here he is, in the middle of a kamikaze attack. Planes are flying around. Torpedoes are flying. You know, things are exploding. And he thinks, you know, I could make a knife handle out of that. <laughs> so he picks up the glass, puts it in his pocket, goes back to what he's doing. And I said, well, how are you so calm? And this makes sense. He says, Jason, we all assumed we were gonna die. We just didn't know when. He said, you couldn't function if you didn't assume that. That's how we function. Assume we're gonna die at some point. We just don't know when. And he took that glass, he shaped it, he made a knife handle, and we have the knife. Yeah. So it is in our collection, um, but you know, and this is where I start talking about Missouri. <coughs> you know, Missouri was Johnny come lately. We were in the battles. Uh, but we'll get back to her in a minute. And again, do please keep your questions to the end, because we have a long way to go. William Bohalsey, probably one of the most famous admirals of World War II, himself from Elizabeth, New Jersey. I don't understand how, how this happened, but because he was nobody important when this happened. The bell of BB-16 is in Elizabeth. So that first battleship in New Jersey, the bell is in his town. Um, but he wasn't really, he wasn't anybody yet. But he, he obviously was someone during World War II. One of only four admirals ever raised the rank of a five-star admiral. He was a four-star on us. He made us his flagship during arguably the largest naval battle in the history of the world, <coughs> the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Now, I know a lot of you also know that there's no gray area with him. For veterans and even historians, you either like him or you hate him. And there's no gray area. You know, Leyte Gulf, you know, it's one of those things, he went the wrong way. He went, you know, he had a 50-50 chance and he fell for the uh, Japanese faint. He went the wrong way. Had he gone the other way, the New Jersey would have run right into the Yamato. It's one of the great what-ifs of World War II. 
Now again, with our armor, one thing we had over the Japanese was our damage control. Our damage control and our radar were far superior at that point. Damage control is what saved a lot of ships. Basically what it would have been like is basically a boxing match. As long as we could keep moving around, we didn't take a, a lot of hits, we probably would have won uh, that b battle. But we'll never know. But it almost happened. There he is. Now, here's the interesting thing. You can actually come and sit in that chair. That This is on the tour. This is the flag bridge. You can come and actually sit in his chair. And the interesting thing, you see the guns and everything. I always tell everybody, when you're sitting there, and like, this is your ride. No wonder these guys got egos. <laughs> now, Halsey was also, though, very humble. This is the enlisted mess deck. He could have had Thanksgiving dinner and the officers in the wardroom. Nope. He had it here in the enlisted mess deck. That's him right there. So again, you got the long benches and the long tables that don't exist anymore. Um, but this was uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And interesting story about this. For him to enter the enlisted mess deck, he had to get permission. So we actually have an oral history uh, I believe of the sailor who got the tap on the soldier shoulder turned around and I think like his pants went from like blue <laughs> to brown <laughs> and there you got Admiral William Bill Halsey saying you know permission to enter the mess da 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 <laughs> I'm sure that's I'm sure that was what happened um, he was definitely a sailor's admiral again we were in all the major battles and now. Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated that since we were Halsey's flagship and we had been in so many battles, that the surrender would be on us. Unfortunately, FDR dies. Who becomes president? Truman. Truman's from the state of? Missouri. Missouri. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gets worse because Harry Truman's daughter actually christened the Missouri. But you know what? what you know, I, I'm not bitter. <laughs> because, you know, the Missouri was the signing and she's in Honolulu and I'm in Camden. <laughs> but the one thing that, and, I, and like I said, we do have a very jovial relationship with our colleagues. And, you know, the Missouri guys were always like, well, we were at a surrender. I'm like, we fought battles. You were used as a desk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, after World War II, we're decommissioned. Missouri is not. Missouri is kept in commission for obvious reasons. And that's us in mothballs. We are decommissioned. We're mothballed. We're not active Navy ships. So there's Wisconsin, New Jersey, and Iowa. And, but we only slept for two years. We were decommissioned in 1948. We're brought out two years later for 1950 for Korea. Korea. That is us firing in Korea. This also gives you an idea of the broadsides and how long the ship is. We fired, uh, what we're doing now is utilizing the 16 inch guns uh, for supporting amphibious landings. We were actually at Incheon. We were there firing at Incheon. So we're now, if you're within this certain range, we can fire and soften up the enemy positions. Um, so we did quite a bit. Uh, in uh, Korea. We're utilizing those 16-inch guns a little bit more. Uh, we served uh, past the Korean War, uh, decommissioned in 1957, according to mothballs. Now you get into the 60s, and you know, no one's really given any thought to the battleships. You know, now you're in the high-tech stuff and so on, but we're losing a lot of planes. One of them piloted by someone by the name of, you may have heard of this guy, what's his name, John, John, okay. John McCain? Yes, John McCain. Naval pilots, pilots in general are getting shot down. So someone says, well, wait a minute. You can't take a 60-inch projectile captive. So what they do is they bring out the new They only bring out one. The reason why they only brought out one was cost. Because if you think about it, how great would it be if we had all four? Well, they brought out one. And that was the USS New Jersey. 
Now, before then, again, society is changing. This is Lewis Ivey. Lewis Ivey was the first African-American officer we had on board. He's still alive. And interesting story about him. Uh, when he came on board, uh, being African-American, he came on board at night. He went into the officer's stateroom. There was two bunks. He took the top one. When he woke up, the white officer below him had grabbed all his gear and moved out. Who befriended him, and this is interesting if you think about it, who befriended him was a Jewish officer. And the two of them became very, very good friends. But you see society starting to change with us. And he became a role model for the other African-American sailors on the ship. Okay, now we get to Vietnam. This is when we get to use these big guns the most. And has anyone here ever heard of someone by the name of Ollie North? Yeah. Ollie North actually claims the battleship New Jersey saved his life. He's been on the ship, videotaped, saying that. What we were doing is we were firing to support Army and Marine Corps personnel because we have a 23 mile range. We can hit about 60 to 70 percent of the country of Vietnam. So we can take out a lot. And again, more 16 inch projectiles fired in Vietnam than World War II and Korea combined. So, decades before Cher was on the Missouri, <laughs> we had a Playboy Bunny. Now, she was actually the uh, girlfriend of one of the officers. Now, I bring this picture up, A, because I really want to find it. That's got to be in someone's basement. Now, the other thing, too, is we do an adults-only tour once a month in the summer months in the fall on board the ship because we have sailor arms. There's artwork all over the ship that sailors did. Some of it I can show the general public, some of it I cannot. We also have stories that I can tell the general public, some stories I cannot. So we do uh, adult-only tours, and it ends with an adult beverage. You have to be 21 years of age or older. And we talk a little bit about this. Now, it's interesting. A lot of people say, well, for a Playboy bunny, she's wearing a lot of clothes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to be able to see from your seats, but she's missing something. Can anyone tell? you got no bra. bra. No bra! <laughs> she's got some headlamps going on there. <laughs> uh, no bra. So, but this shows you the size of the guns. And again, this was a photo op and uh, with, obviously, Playboy and the Battleship. We actually have the best stories. The best stories of the ship come out of Vietnam. Um, we are the only warship in the history of the world, as far as I know, to have two swimming pools. <laughs> what you're looking at, this is the armored gun tub. And there was a quad 40 here that was removed. When they removed it, Captain Snyder, this is the captain of the ship, decided to seal it, paint it blue, and create swimming pools. <laughs> now, he opened it up to the crew. None of the crew took him up on the offer to go in. The only thing we can think of is nobody want to be accused of brown-nosing the old man. Now, here's where she got her nickname in Vietnam. It was painted blue. You got two blue circles. They would drain the water. Pilots flying overhead, you got these two blue circles. They called her Old Blue Eyes. Now, unlike the high schoolers and even college kids, I don't have to explain to you who he is. <laughs> uh, most of them are like, oh, who's Bob Ho? <laughs> it gets worse, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, it's getting more frequent. It just happened again a couple of weeks ago. I'll have a high schooler walking down the passageway and they'll see my shirt. They'll say, excuse me, sir, do you work here? I says, yes. And they'll be like, what exactly is that? Because they've never seen a rotary telephone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it gets better. If their parents don't have one, or if they're not in an office that has one, they've never heard a dial tone. <clears throat> so we have a lot of them working. I take it off, I put it in the air, and they kind of do this. <laughs> And, you know, they have no idea what it is. Now, I have fun with it. 
What I do is I take the hand, you know, the handset that you could kill someone with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I go, look, it's the original selfie. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sort of just back away from the crazy guy. <laughs> so, Christmas show of 1968, Bob Hope actually did his show on top of Tart Number One, and he was on board with Anne Margaret. One of our uh, veterans of the ship that served in our machine shop, he actually worked, he's a, he works in our overnight encampment, sat across from Anne Margaret um, when she was on board. So the battleship has always been a popular spot for celebrities. We will also be utilized as an ambassador. We were actually the official ambassador to Australia in the 1980s for their bicentennial. That's what she racked up in Vietnam. Yeah. Fired 5,866 16-inch shells, 14,891 5-inch shells, 495 structures destroyed, and 391 damaged, 655 bunkers destroyed, 323 damaged, 62 weapon sites silenced, 26 roads shelled, 75 caves and tunnels attacked. So pretty impressive. Now give me an idea of the strength of those projectiles. Off of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, is it was an island uh, called Tiger Island. Had enemy artillery, enemy cannons. We fired some shells, 16 shells at it. Well, the makeup of the island and the depth of the water caused part of the island to shear off. Now, there was a newspaper reporter on board, and we have this in our collection, because he took a before and after picture of the island. The headline was, USS New Jersey Sinks Island. <laughs> <laughs> because we were doing this much damage, the North Vietnamese told the White House, we will cease going to the Paris peace talks unless you take the New Jersey off the gun line. Mm -hmm. Now, had I been in charge of the Department of Defense, I would have said, well, thank you for letting us know, by the way, She's got three sisters, and next year we're going to have a family reunion <laughs> off your coastline. Unfortunately, we all know Vietnam was run by the politicians. They decommissioned her. Uh, actually, as she was on her way back to Vietnam for her second deployment. Um, but even so, the stats are clear as to what she did. And they actually, it wasn't us, but a other entity uh, averaged out that the Battleship New Jersey firing in support of Army and Marines saved 100 American lives a day when she was there. So now we're in the 1980s. And you all know who that is? Anyone knows? This is why we came out for our fourth and final time. Of course, at that time, we're at the height of the Cold War. And we're doing something called escalation where us and the Soviet Union, we have to have more or bigger things. We're in mothballs. We're decommissioned in 1969. There's no battleships in commission in the world during the 1970s. Apparently they didn't like disco either. So, <laughs> no one ever laughs at that. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan becomes president. Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, they're like, all right, well we know that the Soviets had the Kirov class cruiser, which is bigger than anything we have, and it's a missile cruiser. Well, wait a minute. We've got Iowa class battleships sitting in mothballs. What if we put Tomahawk and Harpoon missiles on them? Great idea! So they bring them out. They recommission them, and they rearm them. We take off those four, we take off four of the five inch twin mounts to put on the missile systems. Now it's to make way for space and also for the weight. That's the Tomahawk cruise missile. Now, it's in an armored box launcher, which is abnormal. Normally it's VLS, vertical launch system. These are basically trailers, and you notice we're firing across the middle of the ship. Normally you don't want to do that. The reason why is because the four armored box launchers between stack one and two are aimed at each other. If you turn them around, the flame of this missile is going to take out this armored box launcher. That would be bad. We only have 32 missiles. And they're up on the weather. Oop. Oh, no. 
they're up on the weather deck, as you can see. So if anyone's seen the Steven Seagal movie, Under Siege, <laughs> they're cutting up the ship inside to move the missiles. They're right there. You don't have to do that. Uh, we also have the Sea Whiz, Close In Weapon System, or Phalanx. That's part of our defense against enemy missiles. Because they were very, very afraid about enemy missiles hitting the New Jersey, the Styx missile. They said, well, there was an admiral testifying before Congress, and Congress was hitting them. Well, what happens if New Jersey gets hit with it? Well, uh, Senator, if the New Jersey gets hit with one of those missiles, my orders over the 1MC, the 1MCs are in a calm. My order will be sweepers, sweepers, man your broom. Because it's just going to be pieces of the missile and no damage. Just you, you see the armor. The thinnest armor on us is the thickest armor on most ships today. So, the Sea Whiz, this is automatic. That is a uh, six-barrel Gatling gun, and the white dome is called R2D2. <coughs> Inside R2D2 is one is two radars, one tracking the incoming rounds, one track one tracking the outgoing rounds. If a missile comes in, it goes to full auto. This can fire 3,000 rounds a minute. The only problem is, is that it only holds 998, and it takes half an hour to reload. Yeah. That's your last ditch weapon to protect us. But this is why she was brought back. It was a carrier of the Tomahawks, capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Again, 1,500 miles. Put that in perspective. If we have an Iowa-class battleship with these, and all four of them were recommissioned with these, we put one in the Atlantic, one in the Pacific. We can hit any point in the United States. And we would be doing, we were doing maneuvers off of the Soviet coast. And we have wonderful photographs of Soviet airplanes flying over us, doing a lot of one finger waving. <laughs> uh, the battleship actually does elicit one, uh, well, we also give one finger waving. Um, we uh, we're actually are in the process of working on opening up a new engineering tour so our guests can see the fire rooms, the boilers, and the engines. We have eight, uh, eight boilers and four engines. We have four screws, propellers, on the ship. The inboard are five-bladed, they're 17 feet in diameter. The outboard are four-bladed, they're 18 feet in diameter. If we have guys here, or people here that love horsepower, our combined shaft horsepower is 212,000 shaft horsepower and if you look it up go to the website of the Guinness Book of World Records <coughs> Guinness Book of World Records lists us as the fastest battleship in the world that was her sea trials getting ready for Vietnam that's when she went 35.2 knots <clears throat> that's fast enough to water ski off the back of the ship she, and she sustained it for six hours then the captain thought, well, let's see what happens if we go to full emergency reverse. Oh. So he goes to full emergency reverse. <coughs> How far do you think we kept moving in the water? Anyone want to take a guess? I heard a mile. Two miles. We kept moving for two miles in the water until we came to a stop. Mm -hmm. Pretty expensive. Now, fuel economy. How many miles to the gallon does your car get? 20 miles? Yell it out, somebody, anybody. 30. Okay. What? And yell it out. You're all, so, you're all like timid. I'm not going to bite. <laughs> Cancer's not catchy, guys. All right, so what distance per gallon of oil do you think the battleship gets? A foot. What was that? A foot. You're actually closer than you think. Most people want to start getting higher. The Battleship New Jersey gets, appro oops, sorry, sir. Sorry. gets approximately 14 to 17 feet per gallon of oil. Mm. <laughs> and people are like, well, how does she move? Well, she carries 2.4 million gallons of oil. <coughs> so we always get questions, can we take her on? I'm like, well, how good is your gold card? <laughs> <laughs> so, Unlike the movie. I'm like, oh, don't even get me started <laughs> with a movie. Uh, always. The battle, the movie Battleship. Okay, my friends will never go with me to movies that's about history, 
When Battleship came out, my friends were like, no, there's not enough money in the world for us to go. It's going to be you screaming at the screen <laughs> and people throwing popcorn at you, which is pretty much what happened. I'm like, you can't do that! <laughs> well, they light the... Bo okay, so the Missouri's been sitting there forever. The engines haven't been tended to. They light it up, and it goes. I don't think so. And then you have four got four old guys lifting a 2700 pound projectile. I don't think so. <laughs> and then, of course, when I start talking about this and the historical inaccuracies, my friends are like, dude, there were aliens in the movie. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so... Not to mention dropping the anchor to make a turn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so there she is. Now, interestingly enough, I'll point it out. These two box-like structures here, they were added in Vietnam. In Vietnam, <coughs> there were antennas coming out. They took the antennas off. What they put there later was, uh, uh, it was basically ECMs, electronic countermeasures. There's slick 32s on top. Now, that's how you can tell us apart from the other battle, other Iowa class in photographs from the 80s because we got those two in, this, in uh, Vietnam. The other Iowa class ships are sitting in mothballs. When they brought them out in the 80s and they built that area, it was more aerodynamic. So that's how you can actually tell us apart. This weird thing here, this is a disco and Cajun town. That was put on board in Vietnam. And uh, we actually have our ships horn working. You get to hear that if you come up for special events. Uh, the five inch guns, if you want to come for an event and have it fired, Jack will do that for you. It only costs $500. <laughs> or if you come out for New Year's Eve or 4th of July, uh, how much do you, How much are the raffle tickets, Jack? Uh, $5 for one, three for 10. And then if you win, you get to pull the trigger and fire the five inch gun. Now, Everyone always asks, are we firing a projectile? No, we are not doing <laughs> urban renewal <laughs> in Philadelphia. And we only fire the five inch. Now, I will tell you why. The 16 inch guns are not demilled. If I wanted to fire them, I could. We are not firing the 16 inch guns. There's a reason. We are birthed right across from Philadelphia. Remember, six bags of gunpowder, 110 Z, 660 pounds of gunpowder. Now, they had an army version of the 16-inch rifle at Odeon Point, New Hampshire. <coughs> and New Hampshire is uh, where I grew up. There's the accent. And they fired one round in World War II. Quarter of a mile away was the Wentworth by the Sea Hotel. <laughs> they lost a quarter of their windows. <laughs> <laughs> if we fired just the gunpowder of a 16-inch rifle, you'd watch the shockwave go across the Delaware <laughs> River and shatter every window. <laughs> Philadelphia and then uh, the mayor cool. would kick me out of the city so yes. we will not be doing that and talked about CEC if you come on board you can sit in either of these two chairs and that console right there has the two keyholes and they are what you think they are right out of the movies they say authorize and enable the keys go in the guys here could launch a nuclear missile you actually get to sit there we actually like to say that on us you get to touch this. If you've been on other ships, we try to get you into <coughs> the spaces more than the other ones. You get to go into CEC. Uh, up on the forecastle, we actually have uh, mod deuce machine guns. We've added sound effects. You get to do that. The quad 40, you will eventually be able to play with it. it and uh, the interesting thing about visiting the battleship is you go to museums, you're looking at things, you know, things in cases, or even interactives, but with us, you're walking through the artifact, you're, you know, you can eat on the artifact, you can sleep on the artifact, you can go to the bathroom on the artifact, you know, it's such a different experience, it's very immersive. And for those of, that, those of you who that were in the Navy, there is still that very distinctive smell. And that's the smell of a ship, and I'm not saying that it'd be funny, it's that distinctive smell. Diesel? Uh, it's diesel, bio odor, it's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> now we get, and we're still in the 1980s, because CEC again, where CEC is today, that was the Admiral's cabin. That's where Admiral Halsey was. We had to rip that out, create CEC. Beirut, Lebanon. We were in Beirut. We were actually there for quite some time. And what happened was, we only have two combat fatalities 
uh, associated with the Battleship New Jersey, which is absolutely incredible. Most decorated battleship in U.S. history, 19 battles with two combat fatalities. Mm -hmm. One was in the Korean War. During the Korean War, we were anchoring off of Wonsan. On the port side was Wonsan, a hill with a cave and an artillery piece that we didn't know was there. Artillery is a cannon. Fires, hits the port side, left side of turret number one. No major damage. Ship goes to general quarters. From the information I've gathered, in this, it could be wrong, it's very murky. It's the fog of war, basically. Uh, Seaman Robert Osterwin is coming down the ladder from the O1 to the main deck, and then another shell either hit, air burst, or did something, but shrapnel hit him in the chest. <coughs> He did not make it to the wardroom. The officer's wardroom is the main battle dressing station. That's where they patch you up, send you back out, or if they can't patch you up, send you down to medical. He's our only onboard combat fatality. During Beirut, Lebanon, Chief Michael Gorchinsky went ashore to the Marine barracks and helped him fix the Doppler radar. Well, it was late at night, so they said, why don't you get permission of the ship to stay overnight? This is the Marine barracks in Beirut. You probably know where I'm going with this. So what happened was, is the next morning, a suicide bomber in a van it detonated a bomb, killing many people, including Chief Michael Gorchinsky. The crew commissioned a painting of Chief Michael Gorchinsky and presented it to his wife. His wife has donated it back to us. We have it on exhibit, in the Special Chiefs exhibit. We do have it. So those are our two combat fatalities. Of course we have fatalities, with, you know, we're a floating city at sea. We have electrocutions. We have uh, people dying just from industrial injuries. We have suicides. We had a murder that we talk about on the adults only tour. But we are truly a city, floating city at sea. We have two barber shops, one for enlisted, one for officers. We have a post office because now that's fun with the kids when you start talking about the post office because, you know, I say, you know, remember they didn't have this. <laughs> and then you show them a letter and it's like it's an alien artifact. <laughs> they're like, what, what? Like you write, you put a stamp and they're like, hmm? you lick something? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Yeah. So and they're like, <coughs> they're so like, yeah. So in the United States Post Office, we are, like I said, we had a butcher shop, we have a jail, we have a brig. We have everything a city needs to operate on board the battleship New Jersey. And that's the wonderful thing we love, is when we get the school groups, as you can really see, it's, it's an education. It's not just about, we obviously want to honor all the veterans. And when we say all the veterans, veterans of every war and their families, because you know, the families are in it right there with them, you know, supporting them. And the people that built the ship, and the people that build you know, the things that we utilize to protect our country. So we're, we are a memorial to so many things, and we get to teach so many lessons. It's not just about guns. It's not just about the fighting. It's about sacrifice, which I think the youth need to learn. Now that's impressive. That's the last time she fired. That was 1980, fired in anger, excuse me, fired in anger. She fired uh, in um, training later on. Last time she fired in anger, now. That's 660 pounds of gunpowder going off times three. And so uh, what was happening was, and they were on, now here's the, the funny thing is who we were firing at, the Syrians. 1984, we're still in the little weird. So this was the last time she fired in anger. Uh, was in ni January of uh, 1984, in, in firing in anger. Now, interestingly enough, if you come visit us, all nine of our rifles that we have on us did not fire in anger. 1954, 1954, they took out all nine rifles, took all nine out, replaced them. They have a shelf life. So the ones we have were replaced in 1954. Center gun of turret number two, we were not firing in Beirut, Lebanon, because she had an issue. And she was later uh, changed out in 1984. <coughs> so our current rifle that we have did not fire ever fire in anger. Now, it's interestingly enough, because I'm sure you've all remember the explosion on the Iowa, center gun of turret number two. We had an issue with center gun turret number two. 
the battleship USS Mississippi had two explosions, two explosions, over the course of her career. Both of them set her gun to her two. Mm -hmm. We have no idea why. Could be a coincidence, we don't know why. This was one of the training ones. They did this once. Because when they did this, lamps come flying off of the <laughs> overhead. All of the dirt and dust that was up in the overhead came down. White uniforms became black. Um, but, the, and you would never be firing either side, but it really shows you the firepower. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look, it kind of looks like she's sliding sideways. Mm -hmm. But obviously she wouldn't be if we're firing over here as well. Mm -hmm. It's the optical illusion because you're going to get looking here because this is pushing more water. So, yeah, I love dispelling that myth. That's like Gettysburg with the horses who's meaning something, which they don't. That's, if you come visit us today, that's what greets you. You're looking right down the barrel of a five-inch gun. <laughs> and so this is the ship today. These are the uh, columns with the 19 battle stars. And just this past Veterans Day, we had a veterans car show that covered all this. Uh, Jack, I know your voice is crappy, but how many vehicles do we have? Uh, I think like 30 something. Mm -hmm. We had a lot. Uh, quite, a, quite a few. We have all sorts of events. As I said, in June and September, we have a beer fest. Uh, June is the New Jersey brew fe brew, uh, breweries. Uh, September is um, the uh, international. But you can come, you can actually rent the ship. We have corporations that rent it for events. We have weddings. I will tell you that the weddings are the best ones for me, and that's being facetious, because normally I have to guide the, the bride down one deck so we can come out and surprise everybody. I've carried dogs. <laughs> I've had to lift <laughs> skirts, so we, because we're going through the area of dirt and everything else, and I nearly had to carry a mother-in-law. <laughs> and I was like, so, and as Jack will always say, well, dude, all of their duties as assigned. And I'm like, great. Hold on one second, folks, sorry. We're not sinking. Now we have guided tours. Now we have guided group tours. And you all did one. When I, when I gave the presentation five years ago, the evolution of the monitor to uh, the New Jersey, you all were visiting the following week. Now I wasn't able to be there. Uh, I was actually in Scotland. And if you do go and view that video, you'll see one of the, bless you, you'll see one of the things I actually say is, you know, unfortunately I won't be able to be with you, I'll be in Scotland, but in between pub crawls, I'll be thinking about it. <laughs> but if you want to do group tours, we can do group tours uh, with a tour guide, a professionally trained tour guide. So we have the self-guided tours. We're, our tour two tours on Saturday and Sunday at 11 are, they're guided as well. Um, again, we do weddings, we do birthdays, we do bar mitzvahs, uh, we do everything. Uh, corporate events, and we can do anything f f from five people up to 3,000. Uh, we've done events even with 3,000 people. So it's a wonderful venue uh, when it's warm. We do have heaters as well in, in the fantail tents, um, but we, we can use the entire ship. <coughs> Now I bring this up because I know some of you may not live close to us, but we utilize paid tour guides and also volunteer docents. We have quite the volunteer crew. And so this is my sort of little uh, you know, advertisement. If anyone would like to volunteer on board a battleship, uh, we do have quite a few opportunities. You can give tours. If you want to stay inside, we have our captains in port cabin. You can sit there and chit chat about the ship with the guests. And I also have this picture because of this gentleman right here. Uh, someone that uh, we're very proud of. Uh, he's still around. He actually uh, spoke at our veterans event. This is Mr. Russ Collins. Russ Collins uh, is a restoration volunteer. You'll see him doing restoration work. And he just turned, I think, 92. And he's a World War II veteran of the USS New Jersey. Oh, wow. So that's special. 
very, very special. Uh, and for some reason, he likes me. I have no idea why. Uh, so uh, his taste is, you know, reputed. Uh, but it's amazing what we get to interact with. One thing I'll tell everybody, today was a perfect example. In the summer, in the summer months, we average, I think we're up now. Right now we're averaging about one to three veterans of the ship coming to visit us a day. Right now we're about one to two a day. We're not getting a lot of the World War II and Korean War guys. We're getting their families. We're getting more now the Vietnam and the 80s guys. The 80s guys are now starting to get to that age where you know the kids are out of the house and they're getting a little nostalgia. So they're starting to visit us back. And we have a signing wall on board the ship. And it's wonderful to see the names. And we do ask them to keep it clean. <laughs> so uh, one of the things we have, and I don't have a picture unfortunately, uh, on my slideshow, but in the adults only tour, I focus on something because everyone, and ladies, I, I do apologize, I am going to use profanity. Everyone does know what SNAFU stands for. <laughs> Situation normal, all effed up. FUBAR. Ooh, Found effed up, up beyond all recognition. <laughs> now, there's another one. Now, see, you can't swear, but you can use those words. Now, we have another one that was written on the wall by a Marine that was on the ship, Wetsu, W-E-T-S-U. Does anyone get mm. that one? Wetsu. Ladies, I am gonna say the profanity. We eat this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> so, very proud of what they did on board and it's the interacting with the veterans, but not just the veterans of the ship. <clears throat> I will tell you one thing that uh, does happen every now and then, especially in April. Uh, in fact, in uh, April of next year will be the 50th anniversary of the commissioning of the ship for Vietnam. April 6th, we do a Vietnam Living History Day. That day and a few other days, uh, I've had this happen about maybe at this point, maybe 15 times. You see the Vietnam veteran and the stereotypical, the boonie hat, the pins, the vest, they're walking down the pier. And, the f and he's getting a little ahead of the family. Coming up the stairs, coming across the brow, you can start to see the tears starting to roll up in the eyes. You can tell he's either Army or Marine. Get onto the ship, fall to his knees, and kiss the deck. His ship saved his life. Mm -hmm. And I had one veteran who literally grabbed his son and his grandson and said, like, he just swung his arm and said, if it wasn't for this ship, they wouldn't be here. So it's those days that remind me when you know I'm having the bad days that what we're doing is so important. One thing, and no offense to steel, one, one thing I always remind everybody, we're not just one big steel box. We're not. We're the story of people. The people that build the ship. The people that were in the face of an uncertain future in World War II. We didn't know we were gonna win that war. And the people that kept it going. People who served on it who continue to serve on it. The volunteers and staff we have today and the people that come visit us. And how important it is that each generation has this to be able to see what sacrifice is about, <coughs> what service is about, and how far our country has come. Not only in that, but in changing, again, Lewis Ivy being a perfect example, the women that helped build the ship. I mean, she has a million stories to tell. Now, that gives you an idea of the size of a projectile. Now again, what I'll normally do, or I've trained the tour guys to do, if we have a kid like that in the group, we'll have him sit next to it, and I said, we can fire him out of the rifle. And that's where parents usually go, how much is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, and remember, we do have the brig. We did recreate the brig with a jail cell. We, you cannot lock it. Uh, ladies, we don't want your husbands or kids either. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that shows you the size of the projectiles, how big they are, how big these guns are. Yeah. 120 tons. I mean, they're just massive. Now, you can also sleep on the ship. Now, these are coffin racks. This is what we had in the 1980s. This is not what we had in the earlier commissions. World War II, Korea, and uh, Vietnam, they were open frame racks. 
two side by side, four high, you woke up with your buddy's foot in your mouth. Mm -hmm. These are luxurious mm -hmm. compared to that. These are called coffin racks, for obvious reason. Mm -hmm. And we actually, uh, a lot of Boy Scouts, but we don't limit it just to scout groups. Families, as long as you have an adult and a child, you can actually stay overnight on the ship. Right now we're in our busy time because the scouts can't go camping in the winter. But you actually get to stay on the ship. Uh, we feed you dinner and breakfast through the child line. You get a guided tour of the ship. And we fire off the 40 millimeter gun and we actually do sell raffle tickets to pull a trigger. <coughs> um, if you don't have a kid, just go find one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> that is where the fireworks are. Now remember, not only are the fireworks right there, we do have our own liquor license. <laughs> you owe me on this? So mm -hmm. we do have bars set up for 4th of July and New Year's. We also do sell food concessions. And we have two shows in New Year's Eve, uh, 6 o'clock and at midnight. The 6 o'clock is more family, uh, so this way you know you can stay, watch the fireworks, and then go home. Or we also have the midnight one. And they're right there. And it's amazing to watch. That's the Ben Franklin Bridge behind it, which is why we do not fire the guns. We don't <laughs> want to destroy the Ben Franklin Bridge. <laughs> so I do hope you enjoyed uh, my talk. Um, basically, now I am going to open up to the floor if anyone has any questions. But I do want to say thank you for allowing me to be here before I open up for questions. Because there's a lot of people that enabled A, me to be here, enabled the ship to be here. Right now, we're over... I think we're approaching 600,000 volunteer hours with the volunteers. We have a very small paid staff. It's a, it's a non-profit. We didn't get into this for the money. And, you know, even if we, you know, if we could, we would, even us staff members would volunteer there. There's something about her. We, we say it's the lead paint. It just gets <laughs> under your skin. So um, we really appreciate you having us here. And come visit us. And, you know, so if you can help support the ship as you can, <coughs> the best way to do is visit us. Bring friends, bring family, come to our events. So, questions. And remember, I am legally blind. So, like, wave, <laughs> pop a flare. Yes? Well, in the picture that I saw there, it's been a while since I've been on New Jersey, okay? In the picture that I saw there with the uh, boy standing next to the round, mm -hmm. and right next to that, there was the decks look very different. Yes. Um, which one are we looking at now? Uh, the, the, the nicer deck or the one that was? It's mixed. So what it is is because <coughs> we are changing out the teak deck by sections. We're also doing it plank by plank because we do not have the money to re-teak the whole ship. The, the ship has teak. Now, not we have teak because it, it does uh, curve very slowly. She did not get a new teak deck in the 80s. So most of the teak that's on the ship is Vietnam era, which unfortunately is a laminate. It's one inch of teak on an inch of Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. We also have the two inches thick of teak from Korea. There may be World War II. And the one thing that I'm glad that no one has said yet is whenever anyone points at something on the ship says, is that original? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're like, they have that in World War II. I'm like, that's not what you asked me. <laughs> because in the, if I said, if we only said World War II was original, we're dissing all the other commissions. Yeah. So, <coughs> the teak we are replacing, the reason why the entire ship has not been re-teaked is it's gonna cost us approximately $10 million. Mm -hmm. We are working on the superstructure right now because remember, the ship was not designed to last this long. We are in fresh water, so I'm not worried about the hull. The decks on the superstructure, when we remove that rotted teak, the steel, it skylights. It's wasted. It's gone. So we have to put new steel down, which is very expensive. We are, we are constantly doing that. We are working our way down. So up on the forecastle, there is an area that has new teak, and then you have bad teak. Then you have new teak, bad teak. So we're changing it as we get the money. Each plank of teak is about $150 $180 a plank. And that's about a five foot, six foot plank. Yeah. That's very expensive. Now, trivia question. This isn't for a prize, sorry. <laughs> but uh, why do you think we have wood on the decks of the ship? 
yellow model. And I will tell you, in my 10 years, I've only had two people guess this right. Mm. Nope. Well, wait, wait, who, what? It's I heard a lady say cool. something. It's cool. Keep cool. it cooler. Cool. Yes! It's insulation. You are number three in 10 years. <laughs> So yes, it's the key, it's base it's insulation. We didn't have air conditioning in World War II. Down <coughs> below, you know, in the engine rooms, you're looking at 140 to 150 degrees. In the turrets, you're looking at 110 degrees. So yes. Any other questions? questions. Yes. Well, I Any thought this was absolutely fascinating. I want to thank you. You oh, did an you. excellent presentation. Absolutely thank fabulous. You, <coughs> but I'm wondering. Because I'm so fascinated by it, do the other three have this kind of a presentation? That I don't know. I believe they do. I, I would hope they do. All four are kind of different um, because all four of them are also owned by different entities. So, like we are owned by a private nonprofit, the Homeport Alliance. The USS Wisconsin is actually owned by the city of Norfolk. Uh, the Iowa is owned by a nonprofit, as is the Missouri. You have, other, you have other ships, that, like for example, the battleship Texas is owned by the state of Texas. No, Cassin no, Young no. is owned by the National Park Service. So it gets messy. <coughs> yes, sir. Who had a question over here? here. Yes, sir. You keep, during your presentation, you keep saying gunpowder, gunpowder, but I thought they... Cordite. Cord, they use cordite, which is a much higher energy propellant. Yes. But the problem is, is if I say cordite to a high school kid, they don't know what I'm talking about. So we say gunpowder. Okay. It is cordite. Now, depending on... We do judge of who is in our group. <coughs> if we get a military group, we'll say cordite, because they know what it is. But you know, with a very limited amount of time, with field trips, we need them to get it. You know, get the information. But yes, very that was, good. That, that was one of the reasons that they, they had problems with the battleships too. It, it deteriorates over time. I'm correct. And, and they had a big problem with that even in Vietnam. Now, the the thing they can do though is that it did affect the accuracy. But that's where that analog mechanical computer comes into play. They figured out how to compensate for it, and then they just start hitting targets again. Maybe two more? Yes, sir? With uh, reference to the Iowa's uh, accident, did they ever figure out what caused the explosion? All I will say is that the second report was inconclusive. We don't get into it um, because it, it's speculative and it's such a very touchy subject. Um, what we say, and it is true, the second Navy report it was inconclusive. They're, they're not sure. A friend of mine was uh, on a carrier, and uh, he speculates that they forgot to blow air through the barrel after the first round. There's a lot of theories. Um, there's a lot of theories. I don't think we're ever going to know. Uh, maybe one or two more, then we're going to do the trivia question. Uh, got one back here. Yep. How does this uh, battleship compare to North Carolina? Two. We are actually two classes later. So if you take the North Carolina, um, it took the North Carolina and the South Dakota class, took the best parts of each, and then came up with us. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest differences, the North Carolina, you've got the two stacks. Uh, with the South Dakota class, they went back to one. Then with us, they go back to two stacks. Stacks is the smokestacks, mm -hmm. home stacks. Um, if you look at the South Dakota class, which is the class right before us, she's, she's short and it's the bow. So what happened was the re we extended the bow on us. So the ratio of, of length to the beam <coughs> is better. If you look at us from the air, we look like a greyhound, and greyhounds are fast. That's what enables it. our speed is what enabled us to keep up with the other modern ships. Uh, in the 1980s, the fleet actually took off from Long Beach and said, "Ah, oh, our New Jersey, yeah, let's go." You know, nuclear fleet, the Midway, and so on takes off. We'll leave New Jersey in the dust. So the fleet goes off, chuck, 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 chuck. and all of a sudden, they they look behind them and they go, "What the hell was that?" And here comes New Jersey. <laughs> and apparently, again, there was a lot of one finger waving from the New Jersey. <laughs> and apparently, it was the most expensive showing off known to man. <laughs> Before I, I know you had your hand up, do we have anyone over here, real quick? Okay, yes, sir. Well, I was just wondering when you were talking about the five inch 
38s. Yes, sir. Are you all familiar with the 5 inch 54s? Yes, and we actually, it's funny, we just got 5 inch 54 powder casings. We need to cut them down. We utilize them to fire our 5 inch 38s. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. We do fire the 5, uh, getting 5 inch 38 canisters are very uh, uncommon now. You didn't, in, oh crap, you recorded that. Um, <laughs> the 5 inch 54 canisters, Navy, are not being used to fire. They are actually a static display. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, as curator, a lot of people come to me and especially certain individuals from the Navy and things show up and like, do it. And if you remember the movie, Ma uh, the TV show MASH, mm -hmm. and every now and then he's just doing this and he, get, he you know, gives something to radar and that just disappears. Like, what was that? I do that a lot. <laughs> and it's one of those things like, uh, where did this come from? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. All right, so now, real quick. Oh, last, last okay. one, then we gotta get going. You've got, um your AP shells, your 2700 pound <laughs> AP. Yes. What will they, what, how much steel will they penetrate? Because you've got nine inches, seven, sorry, seven inches at the top of your turret. Yes, we can actually, our armor can take it, so it will not penetrate 17. So it, it, it can actually penetrate uh, the Japanese steel, mm -hmm. which is a little bit of slightly inferior. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember how thick that armor boot that armor specimen is at the Navy Yard. At the Navy Yard Museum, at the Navy Museum, at the Navy Yard in DC, they have a specimen of the Yamato class, and it showed a 16 inch 50 caliber bullet that went right through it, mm, projectile. Okay. And I'm try I can't remember how thick that was. But if you Google it, mm -hmm. um, it does have it. No, I, I just, just forget how thick right. it is. No, I'm just thinking of the hood. And oh, the, the hood. And the Bismarck, where speculation is it penetrated the, the top of the turret they had the um, doors open, went right. straight down into the magazine, and mm -hmm. hood went goodbye. Right. Well, what they think actually is not that it hit the turret, is that it went through the deck, but mm -hmm. she wasn't oh. armed. Okay. She, she turned, and she wasn't armed. She shouldn't have been there. Right. right. She wasn't armored. And uh, the Bismarck had 15 inch mm -hmm. uh, guns, and she only had eight. She had mm -hmm. the two turrets of eight. And um, yeah, it's the same thing um, like, for example, the Arizona. For the while, there was a rumor out there that with the Arizona, the projectile or bomb went uh, down the stack. Yeah. That's not what happened. What happened was it was actually a modified projectile from the battleship Nagato. Uh -huh. And they modified it, and she pierced the deck, and it was a timed one. It went down blow up the magazine and they actually redid, remastered that film. Not only do you see it launching out, you actually see flaming powder bags mm -hmm. coming out. All right, now, the three trivia questions. And remember, this is for wonderful prizes. Well, two free things. Now, let's see who's been paying attention. Now, uh, Jack, I'm gonna need your eyes. That's what I legally want. So, I'm going to tell you, and we do this on the ship, and people do not listen to me. <laughs> do not yell out the answer. Uh. Because if you yell out the right answer, he puts his hand up and gives me the right answer, he gets the tickets. This happens all the time. Do not yell out the right answer. Put your hand up immediately if you know the answer. Okay? Does everyone understand that? Yes. <laughs> I know I'm going to, okay. What is the exact length of the ship? Right there, right there. Yeah, go ahead now, go ahead, give your, give your. Eight, eight, seven, eight hundred eighty-seven feet, seven inches. Yes. Wow. Eight hundred eighty-seven, very good, eight hundred eighty-seven feet, seven inches. One of the things that people screw up with that is they'll say 887.7, which is not yeah. the same thing. Okay. What is the exact beam of the ship? Three, oh, we got a hand. Yep. 120 and 3 inches. What was it? 120 and 3 inches. No, sir. Uh, oh, right here, sir. Yes, sir. 108. And three inches? Yes, 108 feet, three inches. What's this for? Oh, two tickets. Oh, two tickets to the ship. Okay. <laughs> I'll hook you up. Thank you. All right, third and final question. Third and final question. Okay. 
Third and final question. What is our combined shaft horsepower? Right there. 212,000. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do another question because I've already got two tickets. Okay, then. You're making me work up here. I thought it was going to be a Christmas present. I know, seriously. Um, well, do you like anyone you want to give the ticket to? <laughs> Apparently not. Okay. We <laughs> have some neighbors here. I'll give it to them. All right. All right. He's giving the ticket away. Right. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jason. Wonderful presentation here. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. We have one more round of applause here. I think it's so experience. If you have not visited the battleship, please do. It is a wonderful tour. It is wonderful to be able to walk through such a historic artifact as well. Um, I hope you all join us for our last uh, event of the year. It's our holiday open house. It will take place on Friday, December 8th from 5 to 8. Free to the public, we do have all of our buildings nicely decorated, Lucan's Bay and Carolers, course refreshments, uh, Santa is here, so if you have grandchildren and they would like to take pictures with Santa, here's your chance to do it. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you then. Will, G oh. will Gene be running his toy trains? Yes, toy trains will be here and running. Yes. yes, yes, you're welcome. So we'll see you all there, thank you. Uh, Where's my destroyer guy? <laughs> Tin can sailor. Thank you for your uh, <laughs> great check on the attic. That's way too proud. Go ahead. What?